There was a young man who, after he had graduated from high school, decided that college was not for him. Instead, he wanted to serve his country by joining a branch of the military, so he enlisted in the Marines. He went to boot camp and he enjoyed it. He ate it up, especially the camaraderie with the other men. As he had hoped and suspected, he was naturally cut out to be a soldier. He excelled at everything he was asked to do, and at the end of the initial training period, he was taken aside and invited to become a member of an elite tactical fighting unit, men who called themselves the Pit Crew. Following additional training, he was deployed to a hot zone in a country where we were fighting an officially undeclared war. He distinguished himself there and was awarded two silver stars and a purple heart. For security reasons, he had to limit the messages he sent home to his family, but he did correspond regularly until, 11 months into his active duty, all communication stopped. Anxiously, his father made inquiries, eventually to Marine Headquarters, and he was told that his son was listed as missing in action. Upon further investigation, the father learned that his son and four members of his combat unit had been attacked shortly after having breakfast. Two men died as a result of that encounter, and the other men, including his son, had been taken prisoner. Beyond that, nothing was known. Rest assured, he was told, the Marines were conducting an active search for the three soldiers. This was hard news. The young man's parents were forced to live in an agonizing limbo. They knew that the more time that passed, the smaller the chances were that their son would survive. At the same time, they lived in a day-to-day -day fear that they would receive the announcement that their son's body had been found and he was dead. The days ground by with no announcement. A year passed. Two, three, five, eight. The father kept a steadfast vigil for his son. He had taken to wearing military fatigues and camouflage, and he made an oath not to shave until the captors released his son and he could return home. After eight years, he had a long flowing beard that first was brown and then was freely speckled with white, and he was easily recognized and a very familiar figure in the area, commanding much respect and sympathy. He was regularly featured in any local news concerning the war, and he was front and center every Veterans and Memorial Day. He visited the White House and was re received by the President in the Rose Garden, where the President gave him a Medal of Freedom honoring his son. He organized a relief fund to benefit the families of soldiers who were missing in action, not only as a way to help them, but also as a tribute and memorial to his son, the hero. Shortly before the 10th anniversary of his disappearance, skeletal remains were found not far from where the three men had been taken. DNA testing showed conclusively that one of the dead was the young man, who then could be listed as a casualty of war, a fallen hero. The remains were returned and buried in Arlington in a ceremony befitting a brave soldier. The father was given his medals and a flag. He thanked the Marine Corps for never giving up and finding his son's body. He said, Someone told me that at last the ordeal is over. Honestly, it hasn't been an ordeal. We are proud of our son and what he did. He gave his life for his country. All that we have, the freedoms we enjoy, we owe to men like him. He is an American hero, a shining example for all to see of service, dedication, courage, and honor. What more could a father ask of his son? We will never forget him, and I will be proud of him until the day I die. He also said that he was going to continue his vigil until those responsible for his son's death were identified, captured, and brought to justice. That kind of closure seemed a remote possibility. But two years later, a spokesperson for the American military in the hot zone made the announcement that they had captured a man who claimed responsibility for the death of the young man and his four compatriots. The father expressed his surprise and gratitude, and he shaved his beard off, claiming that now his son could rest in, in peace. The Marines, he said, had not let him down. Semper Fi, he said. The military did not choose to release the rest of the captured man's testimony. 
At first, when he was speaking, he was using a word that even the translator did not know. They sent for a tribesman who listened and told them it was a local expression that meant pig, only it was much worse than that, more like pig and devil combined. The man was referring to the young man he had killed. That pig, he said, on a day twelve years ago, that pig and the other pigs, they broke into my home and they opened fire on unarmed people. They killed my brother, my father, an uncle, my wife, and two children, my son and my daughter, all unarmed, all guilty of nothing. They were there for a birthday party for one of the children. The pigs said they were acting on intelligence that bombs were being assembled in the house. That was not true, the man said, but no action was taken against the pigs for what they had done. The man said he was away at the time, but when he returned and saw what the pigs had done, he swore that he would avenge those brutal killings, and with the help of a few friends, he did. I have done no wrong, he told his inquisitors. I have done what you or any man would have done. I have killed some pigs. The acting president of the country demanded the release of the prisoner, claiming not that he was innocent, but that too much time had passed between the commission of the crime and his arrest. Negotiations ensued, and the man was placed under what was called house arrest by the local authorities. No one was satisfied by this outcome, least of all the father of the fallen soldier, who claimed that his son's honor had been compromised by political diplomacy.